Hey guys, George here. Uh, today what I want to bring to you is an, a video uh, which I uh, have entitled um, How to Optimize Your Setup in Order to uh, Meet or Exceed the Victory Conditions. So, uh, a while earlier um, I did a, a video called Victory Conditions Don't Be a Bobby Bac Bacala. And by the way, um, I posted a short video about my uh, cod stew, and I believe bacala is Italian for cod. Could be wrong. Um, from where I'm from in Greece, uh, originally we have a fish called uh, bacalaro, which is um, salted cod. And um, the reason why it's salted is because that's how they preserve the cod, the fish. And basically, you have to leave it. Um, you have to leave it um, in water. My, my, my late mom used to leave it in uh, running water, cold water, for 24 hours before you could cook it. So just to ward off the salt, and still is salty. And fresh out of the sea or the ocean, it's, it's, it's a salty fish as well. Morning coffee. So the reason why I, I mentioned that is because in Italian tradition, that codfish is supposed to be easy to catch, not too smart. Anyway, perhaps I could have uh, entitled the video a little bit better. Um, so all jokes aside here with Bobby Bacala and all that, um, there is a smart way to set up and a wrong way to set up uh, in order to win a scenario. And for this um, purpose, I'm using as an example Scenario four, the commissar's house, which is um, out in um, Beyond Valor. So uh, scenario four of Beyond Valor. And as you can see, it does still use the geomorphic uh, uh, map boards as, to, as opposed to a, a hassle map board. And um, that's an important difference. But again, they started to realize that, look, uh, we're in Stalingrad. Everything is supposed to be a, a wreck. I suppose that before um, before um, Stalingrad was ravaged by Stukas and air raids and artillery, there were uh, in the early part of the uh, battle at least uh, quite a few buildings standing. But by the time the German army got in there, things were probably wrecks and fortified locations, thanks to the Soviets' ability to fortify and dig in. So there is, there is a smart way and a bad way to, to set up in every scenario. And I think the first thing you need to do even before setting up, uh, and I'm maybe repeating myself, but repetition is good um, in this case, is have a, a good understanding of the victory conditions. And in this case, the Rus Russians win by having one unbroken squads greater than or equal to one unbroken squads or its equivalent so you can either have uh, two half squads four MMCs uh, those are squad equivalents and um, I'll put that on the side for one uh, a moment so it doesn't matter I won't mark my file so I can clone it and tell you that this is one squad equivalent and if I have two half squads that's another squad equivalent, right? So, either two half squads or a squad would make them uh, would uh, suffice. So, the 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 victory conditions say either building twenty S, which is here, or twenty Z two, which is here. Okay. One or the other. I don't need both. Um, interestingly enough. Now, if you have four leaders as well, I won't put the leaders on there. Well, I can. Here you go. Why not? So, if I have four leaders in there, that is a squad equivalent. Um, now, if you end up in a situation where you have four leaders in, a, in one hex, and then you have an enemy unit, a four six seven in close combat with them, right? 
Um, some folks that come from the uh, from the classic tradition don't recognize that leaders each have one firepower factor. So this close combat would be one to one, and I guess the best order leader uh, participating in the close combat may be able to use their leadership modifier uh, to uh, sway the the um, to sway the uh, outcome of the close combat. But at the same token, the Russians win by having greater than or equal unbroken. Um, they specify in the victory conditions unbroken. They don't say good order. So technically speaking, the, a squad in melee is, may not be uh, good order, but it's still unbroken. So again, um, if you read the victory conditions correctly, unbroken and good, good order are two different things. So in this case again, you might be out of luck as the German player if you're in melee with a good order, well, if you're in melee with a, a unbroken <laughs> enemy squad, because that enemy squad is still unbroken and in that location. Rule book, rule lawyering. Anyway, let's put these squads, these units back where they came from. I had blown these boys so I can delete them. Some other folks that did not delete. I'm not going to save this file, so I'm not too sure why I'm worried about the leading units and outing units and, and whatnot. I have a backup. Okay. Anywho. So now we are clear that, hey, uh, I need at the end of the game as a, the Russian player to have at least one unit either here or there. Not one unit, one squad, or it's equivalent. Great. That, uh, as the German player, uh, would would um, alert you to the fact that you have to expel uh, the Russians from uh, both buildings. Both buildings. So you can't afford... I'm going to go into the counter train. So if you think that you're brilliant and you're saying, oh, well, look, I don't necessarily have to set up a close-up front, but these buildings back here, um, what is the purpose of this board, the board number one, right? So you're looking at this scenario, you're playing as the German player, and they're giving you an entire city board with level two buildings. And you would think that, okay, if I do this, uh, higher level, right? And you can call that as well. So you have units in the uh, highest level that can overshoot some of these buildings on their blind spots, uh, I suppose. Okay. And um, you put your best leaders there with uh, a heavy, of course, and an MMG. And of course, these uh, weapons need to be manned by squads. And now you got your 10 minus two pits right there. And let's put our nine minus one there. And you have a Russian unit down here uh, more or less, from that level, uh, I'm not too sure if uh, Klaus has line of sight to that building, um, but Pitts definitely does, right? With a minus two DRM, leadership DRM, and since they're they're adjacent to one another, they can fire group, and their DRM as a fire group will be a, a total negative one if they have line of sight to the target. So let's take a look and see, okay? So you draw a line of sight from here, it's blocked there, okay, and you go level one, level two. 
Now he has line of sight, and definitely the other fellow has line of sight. Don't take my word for it. Let's take a, a look and see. Okay. There you go. Range is six. And um, from the other line of sight, the range was six as well. So now these two folks can fire a group and exert firepower on that hex alone, which would signify to me that they have a, they got uh, nine there and uh, 11 there. That's a 20 up one attack, 20 firepower factors plus two for the building, minus one for the combined leadership DRM. It'd be a 20 up one attack. That's significant. That's very significant, but let's not forget that um, the Russians have 12, 12 uh, 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 concealment markers, of which a portion can be, um, a portion, a good portion can be, um, can be um, actual concealments and uh, another portion can be uh, dummies. So they might be wasting their firepower factors. Now, I believe I tried that strategy the first time I played it and I failed because the only thing these guys are going to generate Klaus and Pitts up in the second level with a sniper factor of five for the Russians. If you don't believe me, let's take a look and see. Our sniper attacks that are going to end up killing or pinning good order units on the Axis side. So what should you be doing as the German player is probably ignoring completely board number one because you can set up up to um, up to uh, uh, hexes number eight, but not adjacent to any uh, Russian concealed or real unit. So how would I play the scenario? Well, I am planning to play it solo, and for that uh, extent, I, I made a nice uh, Excel sheet um, to because I'll, I'll be playing it as the German player. It's more challenging, uh, but I will not know where the Russian units are, and if if the setup, the pre designated setup of the Russians um, uh, uh, puts a unit uh, close to the German unit, the German unit will have to go one hex back to the north. Simple as that, but still you're setting up blind, so we'll see how that entails. So what should you do if you're, you, you don't, you, you take a look at the uh, Russian OB and they have several units, but what should you do to ensure your uh, your victory uh, as the German player is that first and foremost your best order leader should be the vanguard of your attack. There you go. Um, your MMGs, I'll explain to you what you should be doing with your MMGs in a moment, but let's put our units here. Let's zoom in a bit. Not that much. Okay, here we go. So we have different kinds of support weapons and we have different kinds of leaders let's, and different types of, of infantry. So let's take a look at the leader, leaders, the weapons and the infantry. Let's put them on the battlefield. These on the side. Okay, so uh, let's go through the order of battle, and we'll give them a purpose before we even set them up. Okay, so we got regular infantry, um, engineers, but they're not assault engineers. Big difference is assault engineers have an exponent, a smoke exponent two greater than, um, two greater than the printed uh, number. And regular engineers don't; they're simply elites. Okay, so we got there twelve, three groups of four, thirteen, thirteen. 
Okay. And here are our, our leaders. Let's put these guys here. Positioning units on the board kind of helps you um, uh, group them and assign them a purpose, assign them a, a, um, a kind of a OB that really doesn't exist rule book wise, but it, ex it should exist in your in your planning for the attack. All right, so here you go. Now you got quite a few good leaders with um, with negative modifiers, and then you got leaders with higher morale in the units. Let's put these guys above. Let's put these guys below, and then you got your eight O leaders. Now common sense would dictate uh, best your best leaders with the best like machine guns however that would be a bit counterintuitive okay so um let's say you want to do a pincer movement um because you want to gain the both victory conditions right um what you'd like to do ideally is really give your MGs to the four six sevens okay. LMGs let's think about it for a second there are three firepower factors right three firepower factors. So if you give them to an, a, a unit that has eight firepower factors, eight plus three, nine, 10, 11, you don't quite, quite get to 12. Um, and I'll explain to you what you can do with those in a, in a second. Uh, first and foremost, you can give DC charges to either leaders or um, eight three eights. And there are some folks that do this. They give the DC to an 8 because uh, they, they, they are considered elite. They have a, a firepower, uh, a morale factor of 8. Um, and quite frankly, that's not a bad idea either because um, when you lose a, a 8 leader, you're not losing 8 firepower factors. You're just simply losing a unit that can rally other units, which is important, just the same. Um, but they can deliver a heck of a lot of firepower with a, a DC charge using assault movement, because they have six movement factors as opposed to non-assault movement, and, and um, and, um, if you're, if you're not wasting eight firepower factors. Eight firepower factors on a multi-man counter that can easily control and mop up a building, whereas the 8 lyric can't. Anywho, that's not what we're proposing here. What we're proposing here is give these weapons to the elite units. Like so. And the flamethrowers. Now the plan is slowly coming together. And let's give the LMGs to squads as well. Okay. Keep in mind that the underlying eights means they have assault power. So they should be moving and attacking. Here, the underlying range means they have spraying fire, which is important. They can attack two hexes using um, 
they can attack two hexes using spraying fire and they have spraying fire for the inherent uh, firepower and the LMGs. So a six, this fellow has a six, what that means is basically they can attack that hex with two firepower factors and that hex with two firepower factors. Uh, alternatively, I believe what the other thing can do is they can be any adjoining he uh, two hexes. Which is pretty awesome. Let alone, um, without spraying fire, they also have the ability to um, create a fire lane. Create a fire lane, preventing the, um, let's turn it around, preventing a possible Russian counterattack. Okay, so we pretty much gave assignments to everyone. Um, and if I'm not going to use the 80 leaders to um, attack with DC charges, what am I going to use them for? I'm actually going to assign them to the fire groups with the um, machine guns to prevent cavalry. And these boys, I will use them in order to spearhead the attack. Um, however, I'm a bit of a coward as you can see because I'm not grouping the leaders with um, units that have flamethrowers because they're subject to a minus one attack. So now that I got uh, somewhat of a uh, somewhat of a, a um, of a cohesive and, and uh, coherent uh, order of battle, I can go ahead and look at my map and see where I can um, position these forces in order to. Uh, prevent uh, or accelerate my victory and prevent the, the Russians from from winning. Okay, now uh, I want a clear line of sight to uh, the units uh, to the map board so I don't make any mistakes and these guys here we're gonna group them like so And then what you want to do is really think about which group will go where. Um, with certain forces, you will have to be able to exert a lot more firepower than if um, than than one side. So one when you look at the the, the terrain here, um, it's evident that here you'll have to cover a lot more ground than you'll have to cover here. So you can. Position the units in such a way that um, the amount of force that you have is commensurate with the amount of, of uh, ground you've got to cover. So we want each side to have a flamethrower. We want, or these guys are all, all uh, with, um, all with uh, DCs already. So each side has a flamethrower. And we've got one, two, three, four, five. So uh, perhaps we want three here. And two there, uh, more uh, salt engineers. Okay. And then in terms of MGs, all right, hold on one sec. Let's put these units here in the middle. They're up for grabs. Okay. All right. So clearly here I really have to uh, play my game right in order to, to win. Um, okay. Where's my heavy? We'll put the heavy here. Uh, and worst case scenario is, uh, if there is a Russian unit there, you can set him up here, assault move, and then jump into close combat there and, and wipe out any units that are there. Um, 
so for the time being, let's say there isn't a, a, the Russian player chose not to have any units here. Okay, keep it that way. Let's keep it simple. Okay, flamethrower. Unless there's a, a a a unit brave enough to for uh, to to set up in BB7, which is open ground, I put that fellow there. Uh, but I would draw from this stack to go to go uh, set up on the uh, on the left side. So flamethrower there. Um, this fellow is the vanguard of the attack. Here, um, let's switch this guy, this fellow here, with this fellow here. Okay, class into the woods. Okay, uh, MMG. Here, for uh, a reason, um, for for what reason? Preventing a counterattack. Not that the Russian player would want to, but uh, this is a great position for an MMG where they can attack either this way or that way by keeping their covered arc in this direction. Okay. Uh, one more leader here. This fellow is an MMG, I keep him there. Uh, and again, he has a clear line of sight to the whole building, which is great. So I pretty much set up everything that I needed to set up here. What the heck am I doing with this guy? Put him in the hex right there. Okay, pretty much. Um, then, um, they're pretty, they are not pretty. They are pretty much set. Uh, so, in terms of a flamethrower, I put that fellow there. Uh, and Wilts on top. Okay. Tang. Lutz. And now we got two 838s. Eight, eight. Um, again, I'd keep them there and here. Uh, the brunt of the attack needs to come this way, one way or another, okay? And these guys will take over this building and then start marching that direction, towards that building. Yeah, and now we got a couple more units here. We can put an 838 into the ditch. Again, worst case scenario is um, in the, into the gully. As if a Russian player unit is here, we'll just put him one north. Um, we don't want to leave this side under strength. Am I stacking? Oh, yeah, so what? Um, in yesterday's game, I, I, I was stacking. And why was I stacking? Uh, pretty simple. I was stacking because... Um, I needed to move my units, six movement factors, without going um, double time all the time, CX. So what do I got next? I got a bit of a dilemma. I got a, a bit of a dilemma because um, I wouldn't mind being able to take over these um, these um, row houses, and um, I'm thinking of setting up my four six sevens with the um, LM MMGs this way. Just to really um, think uh, clearly as to what um, um, keep this. Russian player off guard, you know, keep him off guard as to uh, where the attack will come. He will be facing a a, a withering uh, line of fire from all directions, if I'm able to set up in the middle as well. 
But notice that I am keeping things really close um, with respect to um, with respect to uh, where the starting off position of the uh, German units. Now, as the Russian player, um, you really need to be in a position where you can skulk, that goes without saying, probably also being in a position to counterattack if you could. Um, the building in S6 will be the most difficult to defend, I would say. But I did um, create a setup for the Russian players. I actually created three different setups. Um, and I'll show you the, those in a minute. So let's say you have a nice little fire group here. And you could probably have some units in reserve as well. And I'm supposing that um, if these units break for any reason or, or whatsoever, uh, Wool can probably use the Gully to retreat and um, up them out. Yeah. Now, that's one way you can set up. Um, and I suppose that what's what goes on here is that um, could have the Russian player set up first, which is what the scenario entails, and then, um, and then when the German player takes a look at the uh, Russian setup, of course, uh, due to the SSR, they might not be able to set up in the adjacent hexes. No big deal. We move them back one space. Assault move them the first turn into uh, suitable terrain. And then either you expose the Russian player or um, or um, you engage them in close combat and infiltrate their position, meaning you don't necessarily need to attack in close combat. Infiltrate, go in there, attain your objective, and take them out. Sounds easy, but it's not so easy because there's always the element of luck. I'm recording. 33 minutes. Now, how about the Soviet player? Well, hold on a second, and I'll show you a, a thing or two. So what you see here, what you see here is a, an Excel sheet that I did um, with three different setups. So the whole point of doing this is if I'm going to play solo, um, there is that I, I, I'm playing solo as the German player. I'm handicapping myself because um, you need to do so. Um, hey, look at this. Accessibility, good to go, which is great. You can't see that, but there, there's always an accessibility check I'm using Excel. So the best setup I found out of the three different um, Three different uh, plausibilities is scenario B, which I, if I roll a two d six, I get a five, six, seven, or eight. Uh, that that will be the setup I would use. Um, and I put here the Russian order of battle with six to eight. Each one has a pre-designated hex, right? I can't set up in the open because if I set up in the open, um, well, I'll get blasted, number one, and I can't set up a, a dummy unit in um, an open ground hex because then um, it's instantly revealed and it does serves me no purpose. So anywho, we will play with consuming in our own way, and so far as 
perhaps you do know what the unit is there. It's a real unit or or not a real unit. Um, but ultimately, the outcome is that uh, firepower is halved, so it's harder to take them out. The uh, superscript 2 means they're on the second level here. Um, so what that alludes to is the fact that these are second level buildings. If I take away the V there, perhaps put it there. Oh, this is a one and a half level building. There's no staircase, but this is a second level building here. So uh, setting up uh, units on the second level of this building will make, him, make it harder for them to eradicate the uh, Russians from there. So um, long story short, B would be the optimal situation. Um, after trying three different setups and judging them to the best of my ability, I said, hey, B should help the Russians win this scenario greatly. And, and the, there are certain, after you know, testing the scenario out and going into detail, playing solo for, to the best of your ability for both sides, you'll end up seeing what works and what doesn't work. You might find a little doohickey that is a truth behind or the key behind a victory versus a loss. For example, I know this is a starter kit scenario, but um, the starter uh, uh, kit scenario 88s at Zon, um, setting up the 88s in the in the wooden uh, in the wood wooden tree line at the back end at the close to the exit points, that is really the trick to winning as the Germans. It can come close, but you know, you have second line German troops going up against paratroopers. Something has to give and something has to work. Otherwise, the scenario is not balanced. And it's pretty a, a pretty balanced scenario, but there's always a trick to winning and losing. One element is luck, the other element is skill. And in that case, what I found out playing that uh, scenario is, Set up those 80, so set up those 88s of the tree line towards the exit um, location, and you pretty much got the game, or a good chance of winning it. So here I'm going to show you my um, B uh, plan B, <laughs> plan A, plan B, plan Charlie. All right. Give me a second on my end. So we're rolling again. All right, so let's take a look at the setup. Now, um, this might be wrong. I, I don't think I can make an entrenchment on a paved road. Um, but the idea here is um, to allow a route location, number one. Number two, um, this, this setup is con completely devoid of concealment. Uh, in part because I want to show you what the heck is going on. Um, first and foremost, I'm exchanging an 8-0 uh, leader for a 9-0 commissar. And I'm putting him in this building. And basically, the reason why I'm putting him back in this uh, building is because he'll um, be able to rally all the troops. We won't be able to eliminate them. Now, there's a fallacy going around that if, if a unit and this unit here is a 458, stacked with Nikolov, the 90 Commissar, uh, fails to rally, he's eliminated, which is false, completely false. What happens in this case is that if this fellow is broken, right, he's instantly under DM, but thanks to Nikolov, his printed morale is increased by one, and the DM comes off. So to rally, he needs a 9 or less. Let's try and rally him. Of course he rallies, he's back and at it. He was just momentarily broken. Let's say he broke, then, oops, let's say he broke and did not rally. In that case, he becomes the alert. Now he's a 447, great. He breaks again, he does not rally. Then 
it becomes a 4-2-6. He breaks again, fails to rally. Then he's half squatted. And then he breaks again. The remainder just is, is eliminated. The remaining conscript half squat is eliminated. And that's how the rule operates. If anybody tells you the contrary, tell them to read the rule book. <laughs> Politely. Be kind. And so let's battle hard and back. What the heck? Can I battle hard him? Okay. Can I battle hard? Let's call him this thing. Again, I don't know why I'm preserving these guys because uh, I'm not, I'm going to keep the file safe. Right, so Commissar is an absolute must for any time you play uh, uh, the Soviets. So don't let them tell you otherwise. Number, first thing you do, you have an 8-0 leader, replace him with a Commissar. You don't, you're selling yourself short, you're shooting yourself in the foot. So I put some elite units right up front and close to the uh, Germans, and I will, I will. I have 12 concealment counters. You can be rest assured that these guys are going to be concealed. So he'll, the opponent will either have to break the concealment or go into close combat with a concealed unit, which gives me an advantage. 8 minus 0 leader, 6 to 8. Uh, here, I'm denying the German player any ability to set up there, which means that, um, again, I can conceal this guy. Uh, Titov breaks. It doesn't affect my 6 to 8 because they are the same morale. So there is no leader loss toss check or, or, or leader loss or, well, there may be a, or a leader loss morale check for that matter. That's true. Okay. Here again, I'm denying him setting up in the open street so that he can take over the row house. And here, I'm definitely going to deny him uh, the ability to uh, set up in the woods. Okay, And if he isn't taking advantage of this position as a German player, I'm going to go this, this way. Kaboom! That's, this isn't an assault move. I'd probably lose con uh, concealment, but I can advance into there, go see X, and keep concealment. Big deal. Plus one for being concealed, plus two, uh, minus two for for being, uh, minus two for being concealed, plus one for being CX. Still gives me a negative one advantage in close combat if that were the case. And I keep concealment. And I put the pressure on. Hmm. Um, yeah. So units are being set up up front to deny him uh, proximity advantage. Here I'm setting up my uh, MGs in a, such a way that I can lay down residual fire and fire lanes. And in another setup I put out an MMG here. So I can deny him um, quick axes. And come to think of it, maybe my plan C was better. And Ivanov is here. He should have line of sight to different areas of this board. Hmm. So all this is to deny him freedom of movement. Let's consider another setup. We're 44 min minutes in, but what the heck. So here's another R Russian setup that can help you uh, gain um, an advantage. Um, so this is there only for concealment purposes. So if the German player does it, advance into this building for any reason, um, the concealed unit can pop out of the trench for one, two, three into the building. Or advance into their close combat. And then all of a sudden, if the German player did make any head, headway, into here, um, he'll have a Russian unit in, in his rear. And this is only for for being able to, the, the trenches being here in open ground, it's just to facilitate road paths. There you go. 
Of course, I'm going to deny him a position here. Uh, give or take the fact that um, that um, he won't have a valid route path. They'll have to declare a low crawl or be captured. And then that forces a German player to uh, think about whether he wants um, no quarter or not. The heavy, I'm setting him up here because if the German player decides to attack from here or from here, um, there's a, a powerful uh, amount of uh, firepower I can put down either as a fire lane or exert uh, an initial attack. And in this case, since I'm not the attacker, I am putting my, uh, as the defender, I am putting my best order leaders with my best machine guns. And I'm putting him in a position where he can, you know, uh, he can, uh, I, he has a, 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 a big amount of choices to where to attack and, and whatnot. Here too, there's an MG here to cause a fire lane there. So all the units that are advancing are going to take residual fire. Here I'm putting my best order uh, uh, squads to deny him freedom of movement. Titov has a firepower factor with factors here with some spraying fire. Um, do I ha still have a commissar in here? You bet, or, you bet I do. But in this case, I put the LMGs here because the LMGs can transverse. They don't have a covered arc. They do have spraying fire. So it'll be hard for him to take this um, building fortified or not. And in addition to that, I have units in the upper levels that can uh, wreak havoc on a Russian player, on a German player. And again, I'm using my trenches as valid road paths. Excellent scenario to play. It's an excellent beginner, uh, um, beginner to intermediate level uh, a scenario to play. Uh, it's pure infantry, but it's still um, uh, a good scenario to hone your attack and defense skills. Um, and again, it's scenario four from Beyond Valor, the Commissar selves. Jeez. So those are my little thoughts about how to um, optimize your, your setup in order to uh, attain your um, victory objectives to achieve or exceed your victory uh, objectives. I hope you found this uh, scenario uh, useful and um, uh, feel free to comment below. I have received some comments uh, in the past and Whenever I found the, the comments to be useful, um, they were great, I think. They, they, they add to the content uh, creation of this, uh, of this channel. So I, I, I really like to thank you all that, for those that took the time to take, uh, bring a comment forth. There is one thing that I, I want to show you again. It's vehicular bypass and street fighting. And perhaps this is, has nothing to do with the scenario, but it's still relevant. And the way we read this rule uh, the last time we played it is, um, let's say we have a, a tank here, okay, and a unit here, and a unit there. So the tank, instead of going into, uh, into that hex there, in between two, um, two squads, what I did was I went into vehicular bypass here. Now, according to the way we interpret the rule, this guy here, this unit here, will have street fighting in, against him because he is in vehicular bypass and in between two buildings, but this unit won't because he is not adjacent to them in vehicular bypass. Play it as you will. Just agree um, with your opponent. You play it the same way twice. Um, nobody has ever played a perfect game of squad leader, and um, you know you can do your research. You can go into quality checks. I've seen more experienced players uh, throw a dice on, uh, 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 with respect to making a decision on the rule just to keep the uh, basic flow of the game. It's good to play fast and furious, but always be careful and skillful. 
And with that said, everybody, have a great uh, week ahead. And I'll see you next week with another video, probably with an after-action report for Scenario 4. Take care. Have a good one.